Hey, what's going on? This is the Saturday Down South podcast. I am Connor O'Gara. No will today. He had a last minute shoot that he was called, called into for his day job. So our schedules just didn't line up uh, on this Thursday, which means I am flying solo. I will be joined in a bit by my guy, Nick Roush of KSR to talk about all things Kentucky, uh, potential last stands for Mark Stoops, Brock Vandegrift expectations, his hatred of a certain few SEC East coaches in his very unbiased opinion, and uh, yeah, a whole lot more. But first, Nick Saban's Capitol Hill message was misperceived. It was. If you spent any time on the internet this week, you probably saw some sort of clip of Nick Saban speaking before a divided Congress on Capitol Hill. Depending on which clips you saw, you might have had different reactions. If you didn't see any clips and instead just looked at the fact that a wildly rich former college football coach is speaking in front of the federal government to try and get change to this new era of college football that allows for student athletes to make money just on the heels of him admitting that this new era of college football that allows for student athletes to make money. Um, like, like maybe you, you connected those dots and rolled your eyes. You might've thought, wow, Nick Saban, hypocrite. Massive, massive hypocrite. This guy is speaking about the system is creating a competitive imbalance just as he finally calls it a career, which ended with his first three-year stretch without a national title at Bama. Some said that Nick Saban didn't adapt and that he died. I would argue the guy winning three of the four SEC championships in the 2020s decade would uh, probably push back on that a little bit, but whatever. A lot of people can look at those things and say, well, this is just an old man yelling at a cloud. This is some grumpy past his prime coach who wants the toothpaste put back in the tube and wants to go back to the way that things were back when he dominated the sport and kids actually had to listen to him. There are some lazy takes flying around about just that, like really lazy takes. If you don't like Nick Saban or if you don't like the idea of Nick Saban because you're extremely pro player, you might have taken to social media to quote tweet something to try and dunk on Basically, a guy who is advocating for change while sitting next to Ted Cruz, who I'm pretty sure even Republicans enjoy dunking on. But this is a bipartisan issue. It's also an issue that's not nearly as black and white as some might have assumed based on those things that I already laid out. I'm usually not the he was taken out of context guy because I think far too often people who sound bad in the media use that as a default when in reality what they were saying was probably kind of messed up and they probably should have just chosen their words a bit more carefully and they didn't like the reaction to it. But I do think there is a large portion of the consuming public that took Nick Saban's reason for being on Capitol Hill totally out of context with a few quotes. Quotes like this probably didn't sit well coming from Saban. Quote, all the things I believed in for all these years, 50 years of coaching, no longer exist in college athletics. It's always been about developing players, about helping people become more successful in life, close quote. Naturally, seeing a coach of Saban's status, whatever you determine Saban's status to be, it's as high as it gets. There is a, a natural assumption to look at that and say that in the early part of this new NIO world, that um, we shouldn't really listen to that portion of what he has to say. Or because he's saying that, we should tune him out altogether. This guy is not in touch with reality. I mean, we, we know that college football made Nick Saban wildly rich. And just as players are getting money, it's suddenly a problem for him. He's never gone to Congress before and spoken. Why is he doing it now? Here's the thing. Do I think Saban could probably say a little bit less and have a touch more self-awareness for how those comments will be perceived coming from him? Sure. Yeah. Welcome to the internet, where if you speak long enough, there's a good chance that you'll provide ammunition to fit anybody's narrative about what you are. I am probably guilty of this as well. but. I would encourage anyone who tried to dunk on Saban for being this anti-adapt or die guy and look beyond that bit of overlooked self-awareness as the guy who wants more rules for players making money in a sport that netted him well north of $100 million. Look beyond that. 
Saban went to Washington and advocated for student athletes to get paid. What? What are you, what are you talking about, Connor? What, what do you mean? That's that's not what I saw. No, this is not an old man yelling at the clouds. This is an old man who is probably a lot more aligned with the people quote tweeting him than the people quote tweeting him actually realize. Why? What, what am I talking about? Saban advocated for revenue sharing. That's like as progressive as it gets. Like student athletes getting a cut of these insane TV contracts is something that Saban is for. Here was the quote that a lot of the grandstanding old man yells at cloud enthusiasts miss. Quote, if we had some sort of revenue sharing proposition that did not make student athletes employees, I think that may be the long term solution. You could create a better quality of life for student athletes. You could still emphasize development. You could you can still create brand and athletic development with a system like that, and it would be equal in all institutions. You couldn't raise more money at one school to create a competitive advantage at another, close quote. There's a lot to break down from that. And admittedly, I don't think all of it is realistic, or at least I'm not sure it's realistic. The first part, the revenue sharing that did not make student athletes employees, that might be idealistic because I think if there was some sort of clear option for that, it would have already happened, but it hasn't because making student athletes employees at the university creates a new set of hurdles that calls for, you know, collective bargaining regulations that actually makes things a lot messier and more complicated, especially with the non-revenue generating sports. And that's why we're kind of at this place. But Saban is advocating for something that I think should have an incredibly high approval rating. And I, if it doesn't, it should. Revenue sharing. Think about this. The reason that the sport has changed so much in the last 10 years, and the reason why the NCAA just threw its hands up and said, fine, we can't stop this from happening anymore, is because TV money ballooned in insane ways. And that's what prompted the NCAA to say, whatever, let's just let NIL happen. That change is why plenty of people, myself included in this, who were once against players getting paid are now all for it. The more extreme crowd was so pro player throughout this process and so pro players getting paid that when the pendulum finally swung from drastically against that, like you can't even give a kid a money for a cheeseburger. Like when we swung that pendulum all the way, the other side in favor of it so drastically that quickly, Anybody advocating for the pendulum to swing back closer to the middle was seen as this dinosaur. Here's the thing, though. Saban's not a dinosaur. He's not. He's someone that can be doing literally anything else with his time and his riches and everything that he has going for him in his life. Yet he is getting in front of Congress and saying something that should be so painfully obvious to all parties. The TV contracts are why we are at this point. So then... Doesn't it make sense if the TV contracts can fund the student athletes? Like, shouldn't this be the solution that we're, we're trying to figure out here? That allows for regulation. You can agree or disagree on what a cap should be, but Saban's point is that if we use revenue sharing as the foundation for student athlete compensation, that makes more sense than using collectives. I believe in capitalism, and I believe that market correction will stabilize things somewhat as it relates to NIL, but... I don't believe that this current model is sustainable, nor do I believe that it makes the most sense. I think that 10 years from now, we're going to look back on how weird it was that a coach like Mark Stoops could get up on the podium after watching his team just get its teeth kicked in by a more talented Georgia squad and say, hey, you want to not lose by a billion to these guys every year? Pony up. Saban's point isn't boohoo, feel bad for the coaches or that players making money makes this impossible for coaches. Saban is pro name, image, and likeness. Like in its original intent, Saban is in favor of NIL. Here's another Saban quote from Capitol Hill that the old man yells at cloud folks might've overlooked. Quote, as I said before, name, image, and likeness is a great opportunity for them to create a brand for themselves. I'm not against that at all, but to come up with some kind of system that can still help the development of young people I think is paramount to the future of college athletics. 
Saban is hardly the first or the last person in the coaching world that is up here saying things like that. He just happens to be the one who's retired sitting in front of the government saying things like that. I applaud him for doing this. I actually do. He's not trying to overhaul the sport or be anti-player in this. This is the same guy who talks so much about how wealthy his former players are with their NFL contracts. This is the same guy who told us that Bryce Young was making a million dollars in the first month of NIL before he ever started a game at Bama. You're not necessarily anti-player if you're pro-regulation. So what would that look like? That's, that's I think, what we need to, to get to. Don't present a problem without providing a solution. That's what I always say. Revenue sharing would obviously favor or should obviously favor the core four, just as playoff revenue distribution, that model will. That's easy. Employees or no employees for, for student athletes, you would have each school getting a certain cut. Maybe there's some of that that's incentive based. It's not necessarily a sticking point if we have already crossed over the pay for play threshold in that way with revenue sharing, because that's essentially what this is. You can still have NIL opportunities. So it's not just, hey, you know, here's your base salary. You can't get anything beyond that. But instead of having this collective that pools money together as some sort of a payroll to finance everything, you get actual brand deals that are lined up and you can actually be able to track what a player is doing to earn this money. Instead of the NCAA, you fund the new enforcement agency with those TV contracts. You have a football specific branch of this that can actually look into whether programs are using NIL the right way or if they're just doing the same thing that they once did in a world wherein the NCAA cannot enforce any interim NIL policies because of this Tennessee ruling. And the timing of that is important. That still probably favors the universities with big alumni bases who had their ducks in a row to get these opportunities lined up, acknowledging that. You could see boosters go, wait, I don't have to bankroll this random left guard to be able to come here. And he has his base salary, whatever that is, taken care of through revenue sharing. And I can instead use my money to incentivize on top of that. That That is for some going to be like, oh, OK, open season. But at the same time, remember that they're still being asked to finance things like coach buyouts and uh, facility upgrades and all those other things as well. If you actually have defined rules and not an interim policy as it relates to NIL, there's at least some sort of regulation, which we do not have right now, which is seen as a win. And it is in the short term because it's a win against the NCAA. And that's something that anybody can get behind. But I think we can all admit that there are certain things that we would like to see happen from this. That at least makes it so that this process, this recruiting process, this roster retention process is not so transactional. That's the part that Saban referenced that you can hear from all of these coaches. If you ever watched a show like, you know, The Bachelor, or you watched, you know, The Love is Blind reunion, no spoilers with Trevor, but let's just say the term, are you here for the right reasons? It comes up a lot, a whole lot. College coaches have no problem admitting that they use those NFL contracts to incentivize kids, nor do they have a problem saying, hey, if you come to school here, you know, you go to class, do what you're supposed to do. This is how widespread our alumni base is. You're going to be taken care of out in the real world and be able to start a career if that career is not playing pro professional football. And that's something that's talked about a lot. Adding regulation is not taking away financial incentive. It will always be there. That's not going away. But can we make it so that there's a better way? Because as much as I love this sport, I don't believe this current model is its future. The funny thing is, is like, I, I bet there's a good amount of overlap on the Venn diagram of people who want Nick Saban to be the next college football commissioner, which again, I don't think is realistic. And also the people who dunk on Nick Saban for advocating for NIL regulation on Capitol Hill. Do those people think the sport is perfect now? Or can they admit that there might be a more sustainable way to empower student athletes that's much closer to the vision that Saban described? I think it's the latter, whether they want to admit it or not in some sort of a quote tweet. All right, let's kick it to Nick Roush. Fun conversation with my guy. Nobody covers Kentucky football better than Nick, but he's also just one of my favorite people that I get to see at SEC Media Days every year just to shoot the breeze about whatever. So here is Nick. 
Now I'm excited to be joined by a very special guest. Somehow it is a first time guest. That yeah. that's on me. That's very much on me. It is KSR's Nick Roush, aka my favorite bald man in this business. Don't fact check me on that. Um, There's look. a lot of us. I don't I don't, I don't know what it is. Um, but you know, there's the power rankings. We're working on them. I'm still trying to climb up them. Uh, I got, I got a tough, tall task at SEC media days. I think Pate has actually gone down the bald man rankings because CBS lost, uh, the SEC rights. So he's got some work to do. I actually didn't even factor paid into that conversation. So I might have to read. Oh, wow. Look, I love Josh, but, um, I, oh, look, wow. you're tied for first. You're okay, tied for first at this point. Good. Right. I'll take it. I'll uh, take it. Speaking of SEC Media Days, when you asked Stoops to come home, the look he gave you at first was incredible because he did not know what it meant to come home. He was like, "What? It, like, is he asking me if I'm going to Youngstown? Like, or what are we talking about? Like, Iowa? Like, am I going? No, no, no. We don't talk enough about Stoops holding on for dear life with his hairline, and I'm very glad that you brought it into the universe. The the thing is, Connor, is it. It's never been great. It's, it's the the problem with Stoops. It, you know, Bill Self he got out in front of it, right? He yep. nipped it in the bud, um, right from the jump. Mark was just so busy grinding at Florida State that he forgot, and and he couldn't, he couldn't plug it up before it started fading away. But you know what? Credit to Stoops, he's he's holding on for dear life. And when you're making was it eight million dollars a year now, something like that? Nine. You can, yeah. And, and that's just a dent into what he's making in bourbon right now. So, you know, if, if you can wear hats in most settings, you're good. You're good. So he's he's holding on for dear life. But I did I did at least want to put that out there too, though, Connor, because I don't want I don't want Stoops getting too comfortable. Like he needs to make sure that the circle around him is still checking him and maybe there for a while. Maybe that's why. They've had a couple of lackluster seasons as of late, seven and six the last two years, um, losing records in SEC play. Maybe that's why they're falling short. We don't have he doesn't have enough people checking him. I'm just doing my due diligence as a, first as a Kentucky fan, second as a reporter reporting the news. Okay, counterpoint though, and this is something that I brought up a lot last year ad nauseum. It was a very popular offseason stat that I would default to. No bald coach has ever won the sec championship so think about that mm. maybe he's just trying to hold on to his last chance to win an sec championship by hanging on to whatever hair he has left man and now i'm trying to think of bald coaches and there aren't a ton out there even though it's kind of in vogue now but previously i mean bobby bowden he kind of had a horseshoe right but like, yeah i mean not not in the sec so that's you know right. he's immune from that but I'm just you go back of- and look Lot, you oh, know, Spurrier, great head of hair. Saban, mm-hmm. great head of hair. It's that's like half of them right there. Kirby right now is just he's really entering middle age Georgia country club sort of look with his squaff. Um, bald SEC coach Clark Lee, but there aren't there aren't a ton of them. Not I don't, football guys just lend themselves to having good hair despite being in a profession where they wear ball caps ninety percent of the time. Here's a question. Is Stoops bald by the time that he's done at UK? I'm going to say, well, it does the horseshoe count because he's really close to it right now. It's there's like a little square. I, okay, here's here's a, the better way to phrase that. Is Stoops going is Stoops making the choice to go bald with the look that that you currently have by the way you should subscribe to Saturday Down South on YouTube so you can see Nick's lovely face mm-hmm. and head but is he going with the look that you are going is he shaving his head actively I think that constitutes as Stoop actually leaning into the bald so it's it's a little bit of a long shot if I were to set wagers which I'm you know I'm in Kentucky it's March Madness there's a lot of wagering happening right now I would put the odds at plus 550, no. But here's here's where I think it could happen. I think a lot of Kentucky's issues as of late, there has been this among, you know, they're not the only program that's just in a nail transfer portal and whatever, and they've done a pretty good job. But there is sort of a uh, camaraderie culture aspect that 
that hasn't been the same since they, they really kind of got things going. Um, and so I think I could see that cashing, that bet cashing and Stoops going for that by doing a little, if we win X, I'm shaving my head. I could see Mark Stoops playing that card, uh, you know, whether it's Tennessee's top five, Heifel's got them rocking and rolling, and they go to Neyland and shock the world, or, um, you know, I could I could, I could, could see that scenario playing out. Kentucky gets a 10-win season, sneaks into the playoff, and Stoops shaves his head in celebration. I like that. That's actually a really good idea. I hadn't thought of that. That would make a lot of sense. L- let's talk about Stoops and his future, non-hair-related things uh, mm-hmm. with Stoops. Longest tenured coach in the SEC now, which is a crazy thought, I bet. Um, I I outlined this. I I think he's got one or two years left at Kentucky, and maybe he's going to retire. Maybe he's going to go to one of those like two or three jobs that would actually make some sense for him. But that's just based on the notion that that I've gathered that NIL has kind of taken the joy out of coaching for blue collar coaches like him, and also the A and M part of this, which. That, that context is important, and that's a move that, in my opinion, happens if a certain reaction is different. And that's, you know, we can deny it here, we can deny it there, but I think that move happens. How long do you think Stoops is ultimately in Lexington? It, it's a great question because that was very, the A&M stuff was very real. And it was one of those things where I had heard stuff um, I actually spent most of my Thanksgiving day trying to like get people in Kentucky to give me anything. They did not want to, um, because there was a lot of smoke, uh, behind the scenes in college station that that was real and that Ross Bjork had, you know, seemingly found his guy. And there's part of you as, um, like like I said earlier, like I'm a fan first. I grew up watching this stuff. I got in this to be a fan. I didn't get in this to be a sport. KSR, we are very unabashedly not objective. Um, yep. So there's part of me as a fan that it would have been very disheartening to see the winningest coach ever leave and go to another job within the conference. But there's another part of me too that thought he couldn't leave on any better terms than what he just did. Because even though it was a, a duddy season, right, like they, they had no business losing that South Carolina game, you could – I mean, I saw him after that game, Connor, and he was he was sitting on the ground after his press conference with like his hat, hat in his hand, hand. He was just sitting on the ground with Eddie Grant, his former OC and special assistant, just like he looked dead. Like they just sucked the life out of him. It was – it was – it was bad. And you he looked like he was at the end of his rope wondering what's next. And – to go and upset Louisville and ruin their magical season again, right? They did it the Lamar Jackson year. They did it again to, to go seven and five. Um, so like that, that had a chance to leave on great terms. And then all the while you have the perfect successor lined up and John Summerall where you get this kind of fresh injection where things were, you know, kind of on the verge of getting stale. So when that fell apart and then – as far as off-season moves, he didn't – initially, he didn't really do anything aside from get a new receivers coach, right? And we had the whole Liam Cohen deal, and we could talk about it. Uh, he brought Wolford back. But we initially, Adam Luck and I, we, we do a podcast together. It's a fun show. If you like Kentucky football, 11 personnel, check it out. Hey, we, we, we were fully expecting this to be similar to what happened in 2015 where it was – fire sale. Here's our last ditch effort to save our jobs. Instead, he kept almost everybody around. It's particularly the defensive side where they, they struggled. And it's not like people were wanting Brad White fired because he's been pretty great most of his career, but there's just a lot of stuff there where you thought, how much is this? These feel like moves that, or the lack of moves felt like something where Maybe he's just going all in for another year or two, and then he's going to bolt. And when you look at the roster, if 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 your listeners, viewers have any takeaways from this, Kentucky's roster, they're too deep this year, is just all all three year players and above. It's the problems Kentucky has have not been rostered building wise. I know a lot of people like to bitch and moan about NIL and whatever. Kentucky's got a, as good as roster as they've had under Stoops going into this year if the quarterback hits. 
that's always a big if, right? Yep. Uh, Will Levis hit, Devin Leary obviously did not. If the quarterback hits, this roster is set up fantastically. But it's probably it for a lot of those guys, right? Like they should have, uh, we were at the combine last week, they could have 10 guys, a dozen guys there next year with Deion Walker being the linchpin in the first round. So there's a lot of upperclassmen there. I can I can see this being a sort of last ride where, you know, may, maybe this is it for Mark Stoops. I would not be surprised if this was the last season for the Kentucky head coach. If he had left and, you know, as you mentioned, Summerall is the obvious next guy in. He he would make so much sense as as a successor for Stoops. Um, if, if let's, let's just say hypothetically that there is a rolling list that Mitch Barnhart is, is working with. I like to think all athletic directors when they've had a coach for like more than five years or six years, have some sort of a rolling list. Mm -hmm. What do you think that list looks like outside of just someone that is such an obvious fit in summer? Yeah. And, and we've mentioned him before, if you aren't familiar with John Summerall, played at UK for Rich Brooks, was assistant for Stoops, went to Troy back-to-back -back Sun Belt titles, that that just made all of the sense. And then after that, you you wondered, would William Cohen, like how much would he be involved? But also how – do you want to go the offensive guy route, especially a guy who's bounced around a bunch? I mean, has Cohen had a job, like the same title for more than two years anywhere? I mean, so I, I think he would have been up for consideration – Pretty clear he wanted to get back to the NFL, though, uh, you know, a few weeks later. Um, there was a couple other guys, and that's the part where I'm starting to blank. I think White, Brad White, might have been whispered about. Um, and it, Kane Womack also yep. kind of felt like it made sense. Um, kind of similar where good defensive coordinator is great in the Sun Belt. That's a night – like the, the Sun Belt feels like if, if you have success there, that's a great minor league uh, to move up the coaching tree. Um, so th that, that one, I think I also would have put on my short list. Um, and then the timing might've actually worked out for somebody else too. in Neil Brown, where it, he kind of, it's, it's been an up and down sort of deal, um, for him at West Virginia. But then, I mean, he was a dead man walking the entire last year and then they went into one nine games. So, um, maybe if he didn't want to play with fire anymore, he could have decided to come home. So, uh, but all in all, it, I'm going to think whoever succeeds Stoops is probably going to be a defensive guy that recruits well in the South. Like that just from a culture standpoint, it worked well. And it feels like a Kentucky where you're, you're probably better off doing the up and comer at offensive coordinator every other year. Um, then like that, that's probably where you can max it out, right? Like maybe Bush Hamden's that guy and he's an SEC coach in three years or something like that, you know? So I, I think ultimately they would probably end up going the defensive coordinator route with a guy who can, can also recruit the South. Let me, let me give you a five, five, five guys that I think would, would make sense if, if you're making that list now, as opposed okay. to coming up with it in December where obviously things have changed since then, but a Blake Baker would make a lot of sense. Yes. Yes. Um, I mean, keeping it within the Mizzou coordinator background realm, <laughs> Kirby Moore would make a lot of sense, um, given his his rise and what he did last year. Went 1-1 one, one in our coordinator draft, our OC draft uh, for the SEC, picked by yours truly. Um, someone like Len Schumann, as you mentioned, trying to get the defensive-minded yeah. guy, like, I know everybody thinks that, oh, Glenn Schumann's going to get a bigger, better job. Maybe he will one day. A core four job is hard to come by, and I think that he will be in pursuit of that in short time. And then Alex Golish is one to keep an eye on, friend of the program, mm -hmm. um, but somebody that is, you know, has these recruiting ties in the South. I know on the offensive side of the ball, I do kind of wonder, like, yeah, maybe Kentucky wouldn't want to necessarily go that route, but somebody that is – Tennessee way, yeah. Yeah, um. Tim. <laughs> they want to dip into the Tennessee, <laughs> the Tennessee tree. And then Charles Huff is another one who, you know, former recruiter of the year yeah. in all of college football, who has, you know, ties all over the place uh, at this point. That would, that would make sense. Who's the guy of that five that you, you heard and you're like, yep, I could definitely see that person sitting down, having an interview and being like one of the most realistic candidates. Huff and Schumann really jump out to me. And I, I, I think among folks who are really plugged into the coaching search realm, he's 
Huff in particular, I was surprised he didn't get a job elsewhere the last cycle. Me too. Um, Schumann's, uh, he's a big, like, what's what's going to be the one? And Kirby has so much respect for Mark Stoops that I think he would tell him to go for it. I think Where, so, like, too. Like, I, 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 I think it might work out that way. And it's so funny, too, because this next Kentucky team, it's they, they're just like, let's try to be Georgia Light. Let's get their backup quarterback, and let's go get the middle linebacker who just got recruited over, who was awesome for them. <laughs> yeah. So, if, if, if Kentucky wants to just be Georgia Light, there's a lot worse things to be. You know, people can hate on Bud Light all they want. It's cold. If it's cold, it's it's fine. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with a cold Bud Light, man, dude. No. Like I, I, I remember in college when you're drinking, you know, Natty Light and Keystone and stuff like that. And the <laughs> the day that your fraternity brings in Bud Light instead oh. of Natty Light or something like that, big day. You remember that Bud Light? Like that's the one of the <laughs> that's the best Bud Light I've ever had in my entire life. Oh man, that was a big day. Or you know, like you know what? This weekend, guys, I'm gonna splurge. I'm gonna buy some Bud Light. <laughs> We're gonna... And then if somebody showed up with a Mick Ultra, it's like, God, Daddy's money over there. Jeez. Seriously? Oh, you only want 85 calories? I guess uh, enjoy your Mick Ultra. Now I would I would have a Mick Ultra like any time and would would go, gladly drink and sing with a Bud Light. Um, okay, let's talk about that guy. Let's talk about Brock Vandegrift because. You know, there's there's been a a lot said and written about him the last last few months. There was a brief mm. moment where I was like, "Oh my God, is he going to leave after you know the Liam Cohen thing happens?" Because you know he admitted to me like I did not you know think that was a possibility that he was going to perhaps go back to the NFL. But then you kind of factor in the family part of this. His sister is a half hour away playing volleyball at Eastern Kentucky. Like this, this is still a guy that's very much committed and locked into to what Kentucky is doing. But where where should we set expectations for him? Because I think ideally he's peak Will Levis, the guy that we saw in the latter half of 2021. And you're trying to avoid any world in which this is just another Devin Leary. So I think the public face, the way that they speak about him is – there's gonna be a lot of brake pumping, a lot of brake pumping, because last year Devin Leary was incredible when it came to off the field training, workouts, et cetera, et cetera. And so they got a little out in front of their skis there. And then when it came to executing game time, he struggled just getting plays in at times. So I think the brakes are going to be pumped there, but I don't think they should be. Um, you know, Kentucky, we're speaking Wednesday, March 13th. They start spring practice on Tuesday. Um, so we're not going to get our first chance to speak um, with them until then. But the the thing about, like, if you want to talk, like, people are always going to use the Will Levis comp because he had so much success in Lexington, and rightfully so. And so just to kind of draw those comparisons there, like, Will Levis is – talking about his errors and using the word matriculate when talking about throwing the ball down the field. Like he's a very bright guy and Devin Leary would do the, the, the Michael Scott thing where he would just like get words wrong. Right. Or like the George W. Bush, like last week at the combine, he tried to say that this has always been my MO. And he said, this has been my memo. And it was like, you know, like it's, whereas like Brock, he doesn't ha- he's not a finance major at Penn State or anything, but he's a coach's son who's very much all about his business, right? Like for his free time, he likes to go on in the woods and be by himself and hunt animals, you know, like that's his and but when it's time to work, he's got a very workman's like approach. And I I, I think he has th- th- there's been some talented guys, like guys that have the right stuff from a physical standpoint that have come through Kentucky. But between the ears, it just hasn't worked for whatever reason. And I do think Bush Hamden's offense is going to be better set up um, for Brock Vandergriff than maybe Leary and Liam Cohen were. Uh, but I, 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 I do believe that Brock Vandergriff should be – I mean, this was the guy that Lincoln Riley wanted to lead his offense, right? And you can't forget that. Like that, He has the pedigree. He has the tools. And the part that Kentucky fans in the SEC shouldn't sleep on – is his running ability. I know he said with you, he was talking about, you know, I got smoked, right? Like he, he got lit up at UK and he's going to learn that balance. But Bush Hamden in his introductory press conference, he said, the quarterback needs to be able to run for three first downs a game. And that 
we could kind of run around and dump it off, but having that little wrinkle there, I think it's just so important, so important for a Kentucky offense that that's just a fine offensive line. It's not going to be one of the best in the league. Like you, you need to have that extra element on third downs in red zone situations. He's a great athlete. I, I think that that extra little bit of oomph should make him an above average quarterback in the SEC. I posed the the question to him, like, do you do you see yourself as more of a Baker Mayfield, Bryce Young type where it's more about like, hey, I'm going to stay behind the line of scrimmage and then, you know, I, I, I want to preserve my ability to throw as much as humanly possible because the way that he first described himself, I'm like, how do you see yourself as, as a passer and fitting in? Because we just haven't seen this guy in like actual live reps. Yeah. And he's like, I'm, I'm a pocket passer. But, like, there's no way I'm going to be like, you know, the Bryce Young thing where Bryce Young will leave 10 yards on the field that he can go and get because he has that much faith in his arm. He's like, if I got 10 yards, I'm going to go and get the 10 yards. Like, mm-hmm. I'm not I'm not just going to leave that out there. But I am interested in how they're going to go about the design runs and all those different things because you would think a player of his build who is every bit whatever the, the metrics are going to say. I know he's not 230 like Will Levis. But you would think they're going to use that in the quarterback run game as an advantage or at least try to. When you talk about picking up those three first downs per game, a quarterback should be able to do it. Do you think they end up using him the way that they used latter half of 2021 Will Levis with more of those quarterback design runs and try and make this guy into something that can be a little bit unique because there are not a whole lot of guys that are going to run you over to try and get to a first down? I think that will be the case. Particularly just as a one, the, there is uncertainty in the running back room. I know they went to got Ohio State running back chip training, but there's uncertainty there. And two, I think a lot of it is to try to be Stoops has always been about balance. Whoever is going to call his offense, he wants to be about balance. And I think that, that just the quarterback run game is such a great way to open things up for your your passing game. Um, because, oh, you, you want to man up these guys? Okay. Well, I'll, I'll take 10 yards, right? Like that, that, that sort of stuff, especially when, uh, the, the sort of, st- the strengths of this offense should be speed at receiver and like big tight ends who are good at blocking and are solid pass catchers, right? Like that gives you enough to put the, the defense on their heels some. And, um, the most important thing that, Brock and Bush Hamden need to do, though, is just run more plays. I think the final tally was 53 total plays per game last year. Can't have that. No, it was just, it was just way too slow. Uh, they're going to be operating out of the no huddle. And I do think, you know, you know, a lot of the stuff's checked with me, and it's going to be different, you know, as they do the quarterback helmet technology, like how they operate, some of that stuff. Like, Josh Heupel is going to be talking to Nico while he's snapping the football, right? Like yeah. it's they, they're running so fast, but I do think there's a time where it's like it's open to the left, snap it and run. You know, like what that should that should be a thing that that Brock Vandergrift is able to do with this Kentucky offense. I would think, yeah, the backup quarterback situation with with Bo Allen back in the fold. I think that that potentially makes a difference. How good do you feel about that situation? How can often dictate how much you're able to use that quarterback run game. That's a Definitely a, a big part of it. Um, let me give you a hypothetical here. Ooh, What's love hypotheticals. What, you're going to love this one too. What is more likely? Brock Vandegrift becomes Kentucky's first all SEC quarterback since Andre Woodson, or you on public airwaves, you, this this would be included in that, say something nice about Shane Beamer. Um, Brock Vandegrift, all SEC quarterback. <laughs> And, it, you know, we do this every year, but you got it's not quarterback power ranking season just yet, but Jackson Dark, Carson Beck, and I – oh, I forgot about Ewers, though. See, that that's going to take me a minute, the the little – the Texas and Oklahoma wrinkle. Because, yeah, I can't, I can't stand Shane Beamer. I just can't. It's one thing that me and Mark Stoops share in common, aside from our um, lack of hair. It's just our – it's our hatred for – Shane Beamer, because that dude is such a goober. And I cannot believe Kentucky's lost to him twice in a row. And at least the first year, you know, Levis has hurt that game. And they, they call a stupid trick play on the first snap that goes awry. And you're like, okay, like, all right. I, you're going to lose one of those every once in a while. 
Kentucky controlled that game for three quarters last year and lost. Like, just uh, just was so stupid in so many ways. And they, South Carolina hasn't been good. Like they, they really haven't. They they played very well down the stretch, but I don't think they're going to be that good this year. I mean, I just I they're going to have to rely on Norris to uh, Lenore Sellers to do everything. Like you know, there's just I just um, the part two. I, so I don't know if I've ever shared this story either. Please do. Uh, but Mark Stoops, when he when the, him and Shane Beamer had that initial tiff, right? Where Stoops was being very genuous genuine he was being genuine when he said like hey i really didn't mean anything about like you know, stoops is very much he doesn't pay any attention to what's happening online i don't think he was checking to see this the south carolina video beforehand but he said he legitimately did not know that that was that he he, he it was unintentional shot at beamer so <laughs> afterwards he said he called beamer and like, you know, privately they spoke and he's like, listen, man, I'm sorry. Like apologized and everything was apparently good. Right. What made Stoops mad was that Shane Beamer was, oh, you know what, Mark, you know, that's fine. You know, we're, we're good now. No, no big deal. Don't have to make a big deal of that. And what does Shane do? He makes a big deal out of it. He brings the sunglasses. He does the dancing again. And, you know, granted, if you don't want him wear the sunglasses, just beat him. But Stoops is very upset that they seemingly squash things privately, but then publicly Shane was a goober because that's that's all he knows how to be. I just I can't I, I really just can't stand him. And you know what? I the thing that I'm actually looking forward to here that I think is a a, a, a great exercise and should be a big talking point when you do your like SEC talking points for each team is, and I hate that I always forget his name, but the special teams coordinator left. To Pete Lembo coach. left. Pete Lembo to take the job at, at Buffalo once upon a time, the Ball State head coach. Yeah. Yes. That – how much of Beamer ball is Shane Beamer versus how much of it is Pete Lembo? Because, like, th that that's a fair question. And you know what? You do got to give – like, I will give Beamer credit in saying he – it feels like he gets the most out of his guys. But I do think that that is – overcoming that loss, I, I think that's a legitimate uh, – concerned that the game cocks are going to face this fall i should just clip that four seconds when you said beamer gets the most out of his guys oh, and that, that well that's crazy. also kind of a backhanded compliment so yeah, i wouldn't be the maddest but that um uh, all of my personal anti-shane beamerness aside that's the biggest game of the season for kentucky week two south carolina like you if you want to get where you're going you have to win that game no no ifs ands or buts about it yeah, people get offended when you say stuff like that in the preseason about, you know, teams like that. And it's like, well, Georgia's not the biggest game on the schedule. <laughs> if if Georgia's going to be the biggest game on the schedule, it's going to be because X, Y, and Z happened before that. And those were monumental games to get to that place. Exactly. Like college game day doesn't go to Georgia for Kentucky, Georgia, if Kentucky doesn't take care of business beforehand, right? Uh, like that, you have to, you have to stack them up. And same thing for Missouri. Like, how huge was Mevis kicking that field goal at Kansas State? Because, like, Drinkwitz is kind of similar to me, where, like, he kind of just rubs me the wrong way. And, I, you know, you're just like, but he he blew that. He blew that, and Mevis bailed him out. Yep. <laughs> you know, like, how big – they can't do what they did unless Mevis is the is the, the lifesaver for them, gave him a lifeline, the thicker kicker from – was that 62? I think it was 62. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. That guy, he's incredible. Friend of the show, Harrison Beavis, the thicker is he, kicker. Is, is he back? No, he's off. He's off to the NFL. Oh. Uh, no, he, he had eligibility on the table and said, nope, I'm uh, uh, I'm ready. We, ready. we need him sticking around. It, it disheartened me when Hot Rod couldn't do it. You know? Yeah. Like I, I need my kickers to be characters. Maybe that's why they don't stick around. Yeah, well, Reichert's gone to uh, open door for elite kickers in the SEC, just sitting right there for the taking. I was going to ask you who you dislike more between Beamer and Drink, but I think it's Beamer at this point. Uh, Drink, you can't even dislike as much anymore because of what happened with Mizzou this past season. Well, and and, and that's part of it, too. And and now I've got a, a, an offensive coordinator in Lexington that's from the Drinkwitz coaching tree, right? Yep. So there's got to be a little bit of uh, – and Jamori Macklin started his career at Missouri, the transfer from North Texas recently. So and, and part of it, too, is just Drinkwitz has been better, right? I mean, Beamer had a great end to his – was that his first or second season? It was two years ago, but 
They, Be- Beamer had year two where in the, the, the Tennessee and Clemson victories yeah, happened they, and this past year was year three. Yeah. They got that. They got that big pop in year two, but it's nothing like what Drinkwitz did. Um, uh, Really, the, the, the part with Drinkwitz that just irritates me is when he just tries to go viral. And he tries to. That's the part about me. It's one thing if you're going to, like when Shane Beamer, my first introduction to Shane Beamer was when he went viral after the Georgia game. And he was like, have you seen those guys? And that's he was at least being him. It's a goober. But when Drinkwitz gets up there and is just like, well, kids these days, and he goes on, he's like this moral arbiter of good and bad. When he goes up and tries to do that, it's like, Eli, just do the football coach thing. We don't need you coming. And if you want to pull out a lightsaber every once in a while, if you want to poke fun at Dan Mullen or whatever, like I'm even cool with that. It's the, the uh, you know, sometimes we got to learn lessons the hard way. And it's like, dude, you're going to you're gonna take an awesome transfer. That's going to be great for you. Like, so, so don't, the, the store swings both ways, buddy. That That's the part that, that really irritates me. But I'll give him and, I guess, you know, how much credit does he get versus Kirby Moore? But, like, did not see that out of Brady Cook at all last year. And that's – it. to tie it back to Kentucky fans, there's part of Kentucky fans that are like, what the hell? Why can't – Drinkwitz is doing that? Why isn't that us? But I think on the other side of the coin, it does show that, hey, there's a path for you to have a season like this if things – hit right you know especially in the 12 team playoff those conversations are just they're different now they yeah. the upside is just it feels so much different the way that games will be talked about in november if you can get to that point um let me get you out of here with this one okay. um i i doubt you've been asked this before Ooh. and you're the perfect person to ask this to i was one of many that for the last uh like year and a half i've been saying that if there is a college football version of john calipari that it is jimbo fisher but we got to put that to bed now because that guy's got 77 million reasons to just sit on his mm-hmm. ranches and do absolutely nothing. But I have a new college football version of Cal, and I'm hmm. curious if we have the same answer. Does any immediately come to mind for you? See, because I, I did um, – I fell for the Jimbo thing too, that, that, that comp initially. But Cal has shown a little bit of pluckiness as of late. Um, because this, this team's rocking and rolling. So I'm trying to think of, it's, it's not, it's not Chip Kelly, even though I thought he was, he was having that pop, um, with DTR and co, um, you know hmm. who it is? It's Dabo. It's Dabo. Yep. Because think about this from, from this standpoint, I realize that Clemson football pre Dabo is very different than Kentucky basketball correct, correct. pre Cal. Like I'm, I'm mm-hmm. fully acknowledging that, but guy that dominated the 2010s in mm-hmm. ridiculous, absurd ways. And then in the 2020s, it's been an entirely different story wherein the fan base is admittedly frustrated the adapt or die mantra that gets talked about more so probably with Dabo than it does with Cal, but with Cal, you know, there was style questions, outside shooting mm-hmm. questions, stuff like that. And where there is a very different national discussion about that coach than there is among the fan base and among those that consume it. And it feels very, you know, and we'll kind of wait and see how this plays out this year with Kentucky basketball. I guess maybe we'll see him see how next year plays out with Clemson football post Tyler from Spartanburg, you know, calling in. They haven't lost since then. Just saying yeah, Kentucky knows true. this all too well. Like if there is this past their prime, but you can't fire them because of what they have done for the program. And this, this sense of angst that is felt because insiders don't feel like outsiders get it. And outsiders are telling insiders to shut up and be happy. It will be the perfect comp if Garrett Riley runs Garrett Riley offense next year. Because mm. because that's really like you know, Cal obviously not as reticent to as Dabo was with the the transfer portal. His stubbornness was the you have to play a bunch of seven footers, right? Yes. And like it that that was sort of his and now he's got I mean, Reed Shepard's shooting more than 50% from three. Like, they're just raining threes down from left and right. Antonio Reeves, Rob Dillingham playing guards all over the place. Justin Edwards is now shooting almost 40% from three. So, if Dabo – because really, Cal tried to do the portal thing, and it 
it it didn't work. I mean, yes, Oscar Shebo is National Player of the Year. They had a good regular season, but that style didn't work for him. He went back to one and done, and it worked well. So maybe it's a thing where Dabo doesn't. Maybe Dabo doesn't actually need to do the portal like we're all telling him he needs to. He just can't have his hand telling Garrett Riley what to do. We got to have our offense this way. We got to because that's that's I think the more legitimate criticism of Dabo is just the internal like. It's got to be this way the whole time. Where they're very much in common, too, is that they can be so full of crap sometimes behind the microphone. <laughs> and, you know, I love John Car- Cal Perry, but sometimes it's just like, Cal, what are you doing, man? Like, he did the whole, like, I'm going to flex after the Auburn game, and then, like, I'm just not going to go show up to the press conference after the next one. You know, like, it's yeah, him and Dabo both, they have a way of just, like, some t- my favorite thing, and, and I say this tongue in cheek, is when you ask Cal a question, you're you're like looking for a Reed Shepherd quote, and he's like, "How about DJ Wagner?" And you're just like, "Can, can Cal? Can you just answer the question, please?" You know, um, but I, I I don't think it, you're you're too far off, Mister O'Gara. Although uh, I'm not wishing for a Clemson resurgence, uh, quite like him for a Kentucky one. But hey, Clemson can do it, right? Like, hey, how hard is it to win in the ACC? Florida State showed us not not very. One would think, one would think that is <laughs> on the table. National championship upside is a very, very different story. But if we're just talking about getting back in the playoff, who yeah. knows? Maybe, maybe it's very much, uh, maybe it's very much out there for Dabo. Uh, this was great, man. This was, yeah. this was a lot of fun. We got to do this way, way more often. You're going to be in Dallas in a few months for SEC Media Days, right? Yeah. Um, well, yes. Uh, I'm, I'm having a kid around that time, but we're just we need the baby to stay in long. Yeah. You, you got number three on the way. Yeah, yeah, I'm, we're doing it. Um, wow, August. So I'm hoping to sandwich SEC media days, football media days into like, you know, you get into like week two of fall camp. Like that's we need week two of fall camp, baby, because those stories they, they get a little redundant, a little monotonous. So baby, just hang in there for a while because need to be in Dallas. Love SEC media days, and uh, I've only been to Texas once in my life, and that was when Kentucky lost in overtime. Uh, to Texas A&M back in 2018 with Benny Snell and co. Um, so need to get down, have some Lone Star beers, uh, maybe catch some home run balls at the Derby. I don't know. Is I, I met, everything people tell me about Dallas is that like nothing is actually in Dallas. Like it's, it's all Arlington surrounding area. Yeah, that's that's yeah. that's the lowdown as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll figure it out. We'll have a good time regardless. We'll find some place to karaoke they gotta have karaoke bars in dallas somewhere uh, chris budden is on it for us she lives in dallas she's gonna take care of it for us she has already already confirmed that that we'll make sure that we got our karaoke and that's that the tradition is not gonna die you know in the true southeast the way that we refer to it so that's all that really matters wonderful yeah. wonderful yeah. nick uh we'll do this again soon man appreciate it always a pleasure jersey contest i thought about not doing this today because it feels a little bit weird doing this solo It's usually a Will and I thing. Last time when I was solo, I took that off. But it was also Will's turn. So I think that's why I did this uh, subconsciously, or at least I didn't do it that time. But I decided to still do it this time because it was my turn. If you were wondering, YouTube audience, what jersey this was, watching me talk about about Nick Saban being in front of the government, talking about NIL regulation, um, you probably guessed that this was a Magic jersey. But did you guess which Magic jersey this is? This is, as you can see, I'm showing the YouTube audience, a uh, old Reebok Tracy McGrady jersey. Um, so, and by the way, I texted Will a picture of what I'd be wearing today. And he was like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm, this is the one that I'm missing. Um, if you can believe it or not, I got this jersey when I was in seventh grade. And the time in my life before that was spent as a diehard Horace Grant fan. So when Horace Grant leaves the Bulls, goes to the Magic, I then adopt the Magic as like this team that I also root for, which is kind of weird because the Bulls and Magic rift in the mid-90s. The Magic were chasing what the Bulls had. They probably should have had it because Shaq and Penny were young. You don't you don't need the backstory. You know it or you don't know it or you don't care about it. Um, but anyway, when Horace Grant goes to the Magic, I'm like, oh, I like the Magic. This is a team that I can root for. And that's living in the suburbs of Chicago. And then when when Tracy McGrady went from the Raptors to the Magic, I was like, this guy is awesome. He is everything. And I became a diehard Tracy McGrady fan. Like 
if you found any sort of project that I did when I was in middle school or maybe even early high school, I think my old AOL screen name, yeah, it had Tracy McGrady in the name. Um, that's how big of a Tracy McGrady fan I was back in the day. So it was Christmas when I was in seventh grade and you know, you know, that feeling of like, you know, you open all your presents and you're sitting down at, at breakfast. If you do it this way, if you eat breakfast after you open your, your presents on Christmas and I was admittedly a little bit bummed, I was a little bit bummed because the number one thing on my list that year was a Tracy McGrady Jersey. I was like, this will be a great Christmas. If I get a great, if I get a Tracy McGrady magic Jersey, that is all I want. So, you know, I'm sitting there at breakfast and I'm wolfing down some coffee, some coffee cake and some orange juice. And my mom goes, I think I've left something upstairs. I'll be right back. So, so my mom comes back downstairs and she's got this like black garbage bag. And I'm like, did my mom run upstairs to go and get trash and bring it downstairs? I didn't know we kept trash upstairs. And she comes back down and she's like, I think I have one more present for you. And I open it up. And don't you know it, it's the exact Tracy McGrady jersey that I am wearing right now. And I was ecstatic. I mean, just ecstatic. It was one of those things where I, like the surprise definitely magnified it. If I'm opening that gift in between sweaters, I'm still really excited. But the fact that I had like the delayed satisfaction to me was was everything. My brother too, I think got, my brother got a, a black Kobe Bryant jersey, Kobe Bryant Lakers jersey that was uh, very unique looking. I don't know, like what's I, I don't even remember seeing the Lakers ever wear these jerseys, but it was you know one of those like replica jerseys like this with the wide sleeves. This is very early two thousands. I'm I'm acknowledging that. I, I fully admit that. Um, but it is one of those that has such a great childhood memory. And when Lauren asked me all the time. What's your favorite childhood Christmas experience? And I'll always say when my mom came downstairs and I opened that Tracy McGrady jersey, it was uh, just something that I will not soon forget. And I'm, I'm never probably going to get rid of this jersey. When we go to Magic games sometimes, like Lauren will actually wear this jersey because I'll, I'll wear my, my Old Depot jersey or I'll wear, you know, uh, I have a, a Shaq and Penny shirt from uh, from homage that, that I'll wear all the time as well. Um, but you know, it, it, it takes me back to, to a place growing up where, you know, he reminded you of like these favorite players and these guys that you look up to and, and absolutely idolize. I don't know why I was telling myself at that stage of life in seventh grade, wherein I was probably like five foot five at, at best, maybe I was telling myself, well, I need to get all jerseys in a large and it's okay if they're a little bit big on me, I'll grow into them. That was at the time in my life in which I think my doctor told me, hey, you're going to be about five, nine. And I just laughed right in his face. Uh, he was he was right. I'm actually five, eight and a half. And uh, this jersey is essentially still a dress on me, which is pretty hard to do when you get a jersey in seventh grade. And it's still that big on you as a 33 year old adult. Um, but, yeah, I did not grow in the way that I anticipated at that time. And it is still very, very large on me. But. A jersey that as much as I talk about how I want to kind of, you know, be able to trim the fat off of my jersey collection. I like being able to, to send jerseys that I don't wear anymore to people that have more use for them. Um, that gives me so much more satisfaction than wearing some of the jerseys that are in my closet. I uh, I don't think I'll ever get rid of this one. I don't I don't think I I ever will. I always want to be able to, uh, to keep this and it. You know, it just worked out that I that I now live in Orlando. It's kind of weird when I was growing up and I would talk about, you know, like, I, I don't know if anybody listening to this ever had to do like a, like a million dollar project where they had to figure out some sort of way to spend a million dollars and you couldn't just be like, oh, I want to donate, you know, all of it to charity or something like that. You had to like actually map out this plan of how you would spend a million dollars. And one of my, like, I think my idea was driving for whatever reason, like driving four or five different Lincoln navigators down from the suburbs of Chicago to Orlando to go to Disney World to buy a house, I think go to Magic Games. That was my idea when I was in fifth grade. And then I, I for whatever reason, end up living in Orlando and our company was originally based here when I came down here. 
So that's a long winded way of saying, yeah, um, this jersey ended up having a little bit more use for it than uh, even, you know, fifth, sixth or seventh grade Connor could have possibly uh, predicted living in this place for a good chunk of my life. So, yes, Tracy McGrady magic jersey. We're going to add it to the list. We're nearing the end of the jersey contest. We are very, very close to the end. I have one more jersey in my closet that I have saved for the end. Little teaser. It is an NBA jersey. It is even older than this jersey. It is the jersey in my closet that I have had the absolute longest of any in my collection. Um, and I have worn it before. It's it's an all-timer, another one of those that I will never, ever get rid of. If you have not, leave us a five-star review. Subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can watch every single episode of the Saturday Down South podcast. Follow us on the app formerly known as Twitter, at the SDS pod, at Sat Down South, at CJ O'Gara, at Go So Hard. Thanks, guys. Talk soon. Thank you.